Welcome back to Undulations. You probably wouldn't want to use your Volca drum as a clock, but I figured I would show that demonstration up front as an example of the power and the flexibility of the sequencer that this device has. To make that happen where it ticks for an entire hour and then chimes, basically a single drum hit at the top of the hour, that takes some specific sequences, it takes being able to set active steps at a per track level, and it also takes a choke group. I'll put some more details about that in the description. But these are all great things about this device and looking forward to showing them to you, so let's dive in. Okay, so the first thing I want to do is offer a couple of corrections about the last video where I talked mostly about sounds, a little bit about the sequencer. And the first one involves how we use the layer one, layer two, and then the combined layers with the parameter knobs. I talked about how that if you made a sort of a fixed pitch interval between the two layers, that when you changed layer one and two, that that would that interval would be maintained. And I sort of thought at the time that the parameters on here would be kind of ganged together. If you did one, two, that they would uh, basically sort of be forced to align together and then track together. But I'm not convinced that that's the case. And I think the best way to get absolutely what you want is to edit your sounds in layer one and in layer two. And so another example of that type of behavior would be that if I set the synthesis mode as different by going to layer one, and I'm going to roll the parameter back. And so that puts it all the way at the sort of the last of the list here where everything is in this column over here. That's layer one. And then when I go to layer two, it's where it was to start with. There's a distance of one between them. So as I increase the parameters for the synthesis. Now these are one apart and then I can do it again and now those are one apart and so there's a logic to it the way that this happens so that you can for example change your synthesis source to sawtooth and get the same envelope behavior. So that's one correction and then the second correction more to do with the sequencer. I talked some about the choke group that you can set up in a sequence. I was saying that the higher number took priority over the lower numbers, and it is actually the opposite of that. So think of it not that the, say the six is greater than the five and that it would somehow win out, but more that the number one has priority over two through six, Number two has priority over three through six, et cetera. So just wanted to take a step back and clarify that. Okay, so my plan for the main part of this video is to just do a few different things, a few different setups, and we'll uh, talk about different aspects of each one. And in this first one, not really gonna make anything, but just sort of look at it. So uh, what it is, is I'm gonna load slot number five and this is a sequence that actually, so, so that would be the program, is actually program number five as the Volcadrum ships. I have sort of significantly modified the kit where I've moved some drums around within the sequence and uh, also tuned those drums a little bit. So let me uh, play it. And the thing that I want to do is sort of isolate each part. And so to do that, we're going to go to mute. And as you'll see, there are only four parts that are playing anyway. I'm going to go to number one, the kick. And we'll just look at that. And this is sort of a heartbeat pattern. And so it's on one, four, nine, and 12. And if I go to look at the accents, you'll see that the first part of each of the heartbeats is accented. And so that's how that effect is being achieved. Now, next thing I want to do is come out of that, go back to edit step. We will uh, 
mute one, listen to two, and switch over to look at the steps. Now, I've just had to sort of decompose or, or deconstruct what is being done here, but what it is is that this hit is 100%, this hit is 100%, but then each of these is a probability. And so a lot of times you'll get one or the other, and then every now and then you'll get both. So there's this sort of none, one, the other, both, four different variations just from having those two steps like that. And then one thing that gives it a little extra is that if you look at the slice, there's a slice where it's just a two-step slice on that step right there. Then, if we go on over to the third, which is just the hat, and let me move to that, you'll see that everything is going on the hat, and that there are not any accents, and the main thing is just the slice. And so there's a constant slice here of four. And bear in mind that a slice, it isn't slicing up until the next hit, it's just slicing up that actual step, which in this case is the same, except uh, you can have a step and then a long gap and the slice will still be compressed to that step that you're at. And then over here, they're getting that roll sound by increasing the slicing. And there's no probability on any of the snare. So then the last of the uh, tracks, let me just go to mute and go here. Super simple, I have to switch to it. That is just a single bass hit. And the timing is really good. It is sort of a response to the heartbeat. So now with all of that said, let's go back, unmute everything and listen to the whole thing. So if you have headphones on particularly, I tried to add a little drive to the bass drum so there was a chance to hear it like on a cell phone, but especially with headphones, you can hear that heartbeat and then hear that bass that responds to it. And then the hat is just sort of cruising through there with that nice uh, ratchet. And then the uh, main variety, really the only variety of the whole thing is the snare drum. So I just wanted to show that up front as sort of a how and why things like slices, probabilities, and accents are used in a sequence. Okay, so in this next setup, I want to talk some about motion sequencing, and I want to show you one way that is more akin to parameter locking like you might do on a pocket operator or on a electron product, and then I will go at the end to more of a classic Volca type motion sequencing where you actually turn a knob and record that. But to begin with, I'm going to use the same kit that we were just using. So it's a low, a snare, and a hat, and then kind of a tone. And the tone is going to actually be the main thing that I want to motion sequence. And so just to get things going, I have uh, sort of got a cheat sheet here for a rhythm, and I'm going to edit that in just so that we uh, see how that's done. So we're on the kick there. I'm going to go into edit step, and I'm going to start putting in steps. And uh, then we can listen to that by uh, hitting play. Okay, so we've got that. I'm going to turn that off. And one important thing before I forget is that if we're going to do any motion sequencing, you need to turn it on. So make sure that's on. You might want to clear it out to make sure that there's nothing residual in there from whatever save you're using. And it's always a good idea, as I said in the last video, to look at your choke group to make sure that it is empty, or at least what you want it to be. Um, now, next... I'm going to go to the snare, and uh, we'll put that in, and uh, 
just something quite straightforward and uh, that and that and then we can listen to those together okay and then I'm gonna move over to the hat and uh, we'll do like this and here and like that and like that and then the one embellishment I'll put in is that I'll put a slice on step 12 and uh, I'll make it a uh, slice of size 4 alright and so we can uh, give that a listen and so you can hear that slice in there is a little roll Okay, and so now I'm going to mute everything except for the tone in uh, part four. And we're going to start editing that. And I'm just going to put one on the beat. And so we get that. And what I want to do is go ahead and start editing. And I'm going to make a progression that is a... B, uh, let's see, okay, it's a little sensitive, but okay, so there's B2, and uh, gonna go up to E3, and then uh, back down to D3, and up to G sharp. Now, this sounds very strange, and it's because it's basically not doing what we really want. If you inspect some of these over here, you'll see that even though you don't have a step there, that the value, because of the way motion sequencing works, it matters. So what we really want is to have all of these first four be a B2, and uh, then those four be an E3, a D3, and a G sharp 3. So I'm going to do that. I'll probably fast forward it. Okay, so now that's at least sounding like what we expect, where we've got a solid tone for the entire four steps. But now I'm going to take advantage of this effect and put like a little embellishment in front, sort of a grace note in front of each of these. So for this one, I'm going to go ahead and put an E in there. And I've even gone up an octave, so that's an E4 on the tail of that one that's coming down to an E3. And so that means this should be a D4. And then a G sharp four and a B three. So then that gives us sort of a almost a, a interwoven melody just in the tail of uh, these notes that are being hit. And now, instead of having that just on its own, let's uh, go ahead and bring in everything else. Kind of doing it by ear at this point. 
And now to add a little more character to this, what I want to do is uh, change the synthesis mode up to the sine wave and uh, start to maneuver the amount of modulation and speed. So you can go quite metallic with it. And then what we'll do is uh, try to capture some of that on the knob with the record button on. So this is more traditional vocal motion sequencing. And so I'm just gonna sort of dive bomb the level as it goes across. So this pattern is starting to have some depth to it, I'd say. And you know, the way to kind of proceed from here would be to probably copy it and put it in probabilities and that sort of thing to have a couple of different versions of it that you can kind of A, B back and forth with. And so we won't do that with this one, but that's what I'm going to be looking at in the next section. Okay, so now in this last part, I want to go into a little bit more detail about some of the performance aspects of the Volca drum, particularly how you can use the load program screen, as it were, to switch back and forth between sequences and then i also want to talk a little bit more about probability and chokes and how that they can be used together in some cases so i'm going to go ahead and load program four this is something that i've made it is based on a west african rhythm and i'll put a little bit more detail about that in the description one of the key things about what i've set up here is that it is based on 12 active steps. And so this is a way to use the Volca drum to make something that sounds quite different. And then I want to mute everything except for one part, and we'll look at the steps as well and play it so you can hear what I've got together. As far as the kit, I think this is just Korg kit number one, so it's nothing fancy. Okay, so there's that, and then uh, let's go to the next one and take a look at that. Just sort of a click, and then the next part. More of a hat sound, and part number four is a clap. And part number five, more of a driving bass. And then the uh, last one, kind of a clave. Okay, and then when I unmute, this is what it all sounds like together. And I find that that active step of just 12 steps has got like a nice driving quality about it. Now, I'm going to go to the load program screen. And what I've set up in advance is I've got the same sequence and kit associated with it in uh, program 5, program 6. And other than a little bit of sort of wrinkliness from the uh, waveguide, basically you can't really hear the transition. So what I'm gonna do 
as a part of what we're doing today is make modifications to the copy in five and then make a big modification to the copy in six. And then the last slot I'll be using is slot three and it is radically different because it's empty, okay? And what I've got is a program where it only has two active steps, step 15 and step 16. And the reason that I did this, and uh, let me come out of this, so I'm in that right now and it's running. The reason that I did this is that, say you wanna start from silence. If you go to load program, you can load a program, but it doesn't start it. So if I go to something like this, the one we were just working with, I can start it, but then if I want to try to switch and possibly switch fast, then I've got to go to load program. Now, that's not that bad, but what I figured I would show is that you can also set up this empty slot like that. So I'm in there, that's running. And then instead of just having one active step, like step 16, which you can't really see that it's running, this doesn't uh, show up, I have two there. And the reason I'm using 15 and 16 is because then it always goes very quickly to the beginning of whatever you switch to. So let's go to load program. So now we're basically sort of wound up and ready to go. And as soon as I go to anything else, it will start it running. And you can also use it as a way to freeze. Which is quite handy. Okay, so now I'm in program five, which is the uh, first of the cloned programs that I did. And to be very clear, I've not only cloned the program itself, but also the kit. So I've got program four with kit four, program five with kit five, and six with six. And this keeps any work that we do on the kit. We need to make sure to save it. That way it won't step on anything for another program that we're working with. So what I want to do, I'm going to focus on the bass sound here, which is that. And then instead of having a clave in this version of the program, I'm going to copy the bass and put that over on where the clave was at six. So uh, just to clarify what the copy function actually does, it copies the layer sounds, but it also copies the sequence itself. So we've got same thing both places. Now, what I'm going to do is mute everything except for part six, and we'll run that. And what I want to do is do some pitch variation on this, and I don't have quantization on, so it's just going to be to kind of give it a tonal quality. So that would get old pretty quick. What I'm going to do is mute it, and then we're going to go to part number five and kind of show you a method of using probabilities and chokes to screen another part. So uh, that'll become clear as I do it. What I'm going to do is uh, go. To make, I got to make sure I'm in part five. So now we're listening to what we're looking at and uh, I'm going to set the probability of this step at 80 all of them around 80 and normally I'm used to using probability where it's something that happens sort of infrequently and that is a good way to use it but you can also use it as something to cause something to infrequently drop out and now when I unmute and we're listening to five and six together, we'll still hear the sort of melodic part where I was changing the pitch, but you can also hear 
the original bass sound on top of that with the probability controlling whether it happens or not. And this is where the choke group comes in that I'm gonna get out of edit and hit the choke group. And by having the probability altered one choke the melodic one, it mostly just sounds like our normal bass pattern. But then we get some occasional uh, kind of glitchiness from the uh, pitch altered part. And I'm not saying that this is of great musical quality, but it's just the, this sort of usage of probability to indirectly influence another part by chokes is a very useful sort of thing on the vocal drum. So I'm gonna hit stop. Okay, so I'm gonna save the kit to five and then save the program to five. And now we'll have the two different variations. All right, whoops, I saved the mutes. That is entirely possible to do, which is good. It's nice that the mutes are a part of the save, but uh, I'm gonna go ahead and now save that in program five. So if we do load program, I'll hit play so we can hear it. And so, yeah, that's what we were expecting, where we get an occasional sort of tonal glitch sound. Okay, so that's program five done, our first variation on the original. Okay, let's make one more variation. I'm gonna load program six, which is just a copy of program four. And what I wanna do in this case is clear everything out for the sequence. So let's see, that's gonna be clear all. I'll clear the motion sequencing. I don't think there are any chokes. And so that is empty. Now we're gonna use the same parts though and this is just something that I think will give a good variety to what we already have it's simple straightforward even kind of silly but what I want to do is come over to part one and I'm gonna change the active step to just the final step and part two same thing, part three. So we're gonna make a one step sequence. And there we go. Now, uh, then what I'm gonna do is put in some steps for everything. And to be clear, if we just put a step on the 16th step, for all of them, we would just get every drum hit, every beat, and that would not be good. So to open it up, what we're gonna do is put some probability to it again. And this is down on the other side of things. I'm gonna go to 25% for this part. We'll move to here, put a step there, 25%. And key thing to note on this is that you don't have to use equal probabilities for something like this. So this is just going to be sort of a, you can think of it that if we've got six tracks that it's kind of like a random chord of the tracks. And uh, then we'll go here, do this one. Not sure. Okay. Yeah. Then to here and to here and that's it so let's listen to it and so I'm thinking of that as kind of like a break between the other sound all right so we'll save that Program six. Okay, 
So now we've got four things. We've got the empty, we've got the original a variation with some tone, and then just that straight random one step sequence. So to play this, let's go to program three, the empty one. We'll come out, we'll hit play, and then we'll go back in to load, and we're good to go. the clave sound and then this melodic part I mean I'm just kind of uh, doing it on the fly but you could really make it to where it uh, sort of filled exactly the way you want it and then a break maybe a freeze Okay, and so that kind of gives you an idea of how you can use the load program screen to jump around between programs and have more of an extended piece. All right, I feel like we're covering a lot of ground on the Volca drum. I think it's been an interesting device to work with and has a lot of features that takes a while to kind of sort out how they all work, but overall I've been quite happy with it. In the next video, I am going to be taking a look at hooking the uh, Volga drum up to other things, so something like the Korg SQ1 sequencer, syncing it to a pocket operator. Uh, something a little bit more powerful like the BeatStep Pro and uh, also just going into the DAW and seeing how the parameter controls work there. So I look forward to sharing that and I appreciate everybody watching and I will see you in the next one. Hey, I'm back. You may have noticed that I didn't say anything about the randomize feature on the Volca drum where that you can randomize either the layers or pattern of a part that you're working on and it's a cool feature but I'll just say that it requires a lot of patience and I believe the reason for that is uh, it's something to do with the parameter space that you're dealing with and uh, sometimes I talk about parameter spaces on this channel I'll just clarify what I mean that if you've only got one knob and it's a continuous knob then you can select anything on this line here now, if it has a set of fixed settings, then that would just be some dots that you could select where these correspond to different parameter settings. If you had two knobs, then that would be an area where if it was continuous, you could pick a point anywhere out in there. So you might have a whole lot of settings even for just two parameters. Now, if they're discrete, then you end up with more of a grid or a lattice where each one of these points would correspond to the two knob settings. Then, as you start adding parameters, you know, you get into 3D and uh, 4D and even more, so you have a very complex shape, and the Volca drum is something like that, and uh, gotta say, you have to hunt around for a sound. And so if you think of something like this in the many worlds interpretation or the Everettian interpretation of quantum mechanics, Every time we make a random choice on here, we could well be sort of splitting our timeline and ending up in a specific timeline that has a specific set of parameters. So let's do that. And I will, uh, let's see, select part one, randomize the layer, randomize the pattern, and part two, randomize the layer, randomize the pattern. 
and so forth. And each time a random choice like this is made, we are further refining the timeline, the world that we're in, if you will. And so we're ending up with that. And so here's where we are.